So it's going to be Acts chapter 5 as we continue our study um, through the book of Acts. Excuse me while I grab my phone. I like to time myself to make sure I'm not boring you to death. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much just for this morning and just uh, giving us this opportunity, Lord, just to come together and just seek you. Lord, to glorify your name. Lord, as we just partook of communion and just remembered, as John said, the uh, new covenant that we have. Not based on anything that we do, but based upon everything that you have done for us, Lord. I pray that we would remember that. And Lord, as we open up your word this morning, I pray we would be filled with your spirit as he teaches us and guides us and directs us through this passage. That he would fill me to speak your word, not my opinions or thoughts or anything like that. But that above all else, you would be glorified and we would leave here changed, obedient, not just hearers of your word, but doers. It's in your name we pray. Amen. So Acts chapter 5, starting in verse 17. Then the high priest rose up and all those who were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and they were filled with indignation and laid their hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. Now as we've seen in the last chapter, if you were with us, When the Lord is working, the devil is too. That's a common theme usually throughout the book of Acts. The Lord does his work and right on the coattails of that, the devil is trying to copy or outdo the Lord, outwork the Lord. We saw that from the very beginning in the book of Genesis. God creates heaven and earth, has this beautiful garden, all these great fruit trees, animals, a a perfect relationship between God and man, a perfect relationship between man and woman. And it's great. It's paradise. And all of a sudden, the snake and tempts Eve and Adam. We all know the rest. Sin enters the world for everyone after them, which is all of us. But we've seen that Satan loves to work just as much as the Lord does. He, well, he thinks he can outwork the Lord. But he's always on the coattails. And so we see here that these leaders, these Sadducees, the high priest rose up and the sect were with them. Verse 17 tells us the Sadducees. They see all the people bringing to them the healed, bringing the people to the apostles to be healed, the lame, the sick, the blind, people with demons. As we saw in the first part of this chapter. And they start to feel a certain way. They start, you know, they weren't happy with that. Because they were no longer attending their church. They were no longer going to them for all the things that they needed. No, they were going to the apostles, these fishermen, tax collector, crazy people in their eyes, uneducated, ignorant, dirty, smelly. Just a a few weeks ago, they thought they were drunk. At the, the day of Pentecost. They started to feel, they didn't like that. Their sphere of influence was being chipped away at. Now in the New King James, it says they were filled with indignation. But the Greek word used for indignation here is zelos, which is actually translated as jealous. Maybe some of your translations actually say that. They were filled with jealousy towards the apostles. Now one of the main reasons that these people were jealous, obviously, is is because of their sphere of influence, but also the Sadducees. Luke was, was uh, wise enough to throw in here that they were the sect of the Sadducees. Now, the Sadducees were a, a peculiar kind of um, Jewish council. They didn't believe in the supernatural. They didn't believe in miracles. They didn't believe in angels. They didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead. And uh, that was, at this time, everything the apostles stood for. <laughs> Miracles, angels, the resurrection of the dead. And so not only were they taking the people away, but they were teaching something different. And the people liked it, but they didn't like it. So they were jealous. Do you ever look at someone else's life, their ministry or their church, and get jealous? I mean, I've talked to people before. You know, when, when they go to a certain church and... And, and all of a sudden, oh, that church. Well, that church is just too big, or it's too small, or it's not this or that. And, you know, 
want some peanut butter with the jelly? I mean, <laughs> feeling really jealous there about what's going on in that, that church, that building. But this time, their jealousy moved them to action. And we see that they take the apostles captive again. They lead them to the common prison. And in verse 19, But at night an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, Go stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. Now the first thing that sticks out there in verse 19 is this word, but. As we've seen before, it means what is about to be said will be contrary to what was just said. Will go against what was just said. We just read that by jealousy, by jealousy, by the work of the enemy, by the work of Satan, these things were done. The Sadducees arrest the apostles. A work of the enemy. Now with this word but, we're going to see the contrast. The work of the Lord. In Genesis 50, 20, Joseph said to his brothers when um, he reveals himself to them that, hey, I'm your brother Joseph. You sold into captivity and you wrote off as dead and told my dad I was dead. That's me. And now I hold your life in my hands. That's me. And they start asking for forgiveness and, oh my gosh, please don't kill us, all these things. And Joseph, if in Genesis 50, 20, tells them, what you meant for evil, the Lord meant for good. And throughout the book of Acts, I mean, that, that could really be a theme, one of the main themes throughout the book of Acts. What the enemy uses for evil, what man uses for evil, the Lord uses for good. I mean, you read the stories of Acts and all the times that, I mean, it's like a movie. You know, it's the cliffhanger. And then all of a sudden you're like, there's no way he can escape. And they escape. The Lord shows up. Man cannot stop the work on, of the Lord. And, and we'll get to that a little later, actually, more. Now Luke kind of nonchalantly, 19 and 20, two verses, um, a lot happens. And Luke nonchalantly just says that God intervenes through an angel miraculously opening the prison doors and allowing them to leave. Opens the door, and no one sees what's going on. He just says, an angel shows up, messenger from the Lord, opens the prison doors, and they're, they're let out. I mean, that, that catches you up, right? <laughs> Not much going on there. This is actually the first of three times in the book of Acts that the Lord delivers the apostles out of prison. But each time, it's a little different. It's done a different way. This time, it just says the angel opened the door. One other time, there was an earthquake that shook the whole prison and all the cells flung open and the guard is scared, attempts to kill himself and, and Paul says, no, please don't do that. We're, we're not here to take, don't, don't take your life, please don't. The third time, Paul is actually shackled in between two Roman guards and an angel somehow leads him. He thinks it's a vision, or no, I'm sorry, Peter th thinks it's a vision and leads him out. He, he thinks, you know, again, this is just a dream. He realizes, I'm free. <laughs> this is different. Just goes to show you, too, that the Lord doesn't work in a certain cookie-cutter fashion. If the Lord's working over there in a certain way, bless it, that's awesome. He's working over here in a certain way. If the Lord's working in someone's life doing that thing, awesome, let the Lord work. He's doing something in your life a different way. I don't like sugar cookies. I like chocolate chip. You know, different cookies, different works. But before they leave, the angel may have their freedom. The messenger of the Lord tells them to do three things now that they are free. And these three things really um, are relevant to us as believers because it's the thing that the Lord has told us to do now that we are free, free from our sins, free from the bondage. The first thing he tells them to do is go. Some of you maybe have already thinking, and this should have reminded them, the apostles, Peter and John here, of the commandment that Jesus gave to them right before he ascended to the Father in Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20. Go into all the earth, making disciples, baptizing them. Go. As Christians, we're not to be reclusive hermits, but we are to go. Where are you going? And, and, is, and I think the most important question, rather than where are you going, but is God taking you there? There's a lot of people going places. 
but they're fighting against the current of God. And that doesn't mean you have to go to Uganda, go to Haiti. That can mean you have to go to work, go to school, go to your brother's house, <laughs> your neighbor's house. We're supposed to go. The next thing the angel says is to stand. They were to go back to the place where they were arrested and take a stand. Very interesting. Go stand in the temple. That's where they were just arrested, was the temple, that area. You mean you want me to go back into the place where they just, I mean, you, you just freed me. You want me to just go back to the prison instead? That'd be quicker. Save us a lot of hassle and time. No, angel tells them to stand. And in the New Testament, the idea of standing is found in really most of the books. If you do a word search of the word stand, um, I did. And then I was like, well, I, that would be my whole message, would be just referencing verses that say stand. So that's your homework. But it speaks of resilience, perseverance, fortitude. They were just arrested for doing what they knew what was right. But were they going to continue doing it? When opposition comes our way, do we continue knowing what we've done is right? Or do we just give up? So he tells them to stand. And, and it's going to be a good reason because it's not going to be easy. The last thing the angel tells them to do is speak the words of life. They were to continue speaking the thing that they were imprisoned for because it was the words of life. And I'm sure when he heard this, Peter was reminded of what he confessed to Jesus in John 6, verse 68. Remember, Jesus asked, asked him, you know, who do people say that I, who do you say that I am? And they start saying, or, or I'm sorry, that, wrong, wrong context. Jesus had just told the people to, um, as we partook this morning, to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And people are like, whoa, it's getting a little crazy. I, was, I liked it when you were healing me and stuff, and, you know, that was cool. And you were telling off the Pharisees, yeah, I don't got to tithe to them anymore. But now I have to eat your flesh and drink your blood. I knew, I knew there was a catch somewhere. And everyone leaves. And Jesus looks at his disciples and says, why haven't you guys left? Peter says in John 6, 68, Lord, to whom shall we go? You, actually in the Greek, you alone have the words of eternal life. Peter knew that it was only Christ that had the words to eternal life. And so the angel encourages them, look, you were just arrested for doing this, for preaching this, for teaching this. I want you to continue doing that. Because this is the words of life. The gospel message is not a feel-good story or just our personal testimony, although that's part of it. But it is the words of life. The only cure for this thing called sin. So we see in verse 21 how they react to that. And when they heard that, they entered the temple early in the morning and taught. But the high priest and those with him came and called the council together with the, all the elders of the children of Israel and sent to the prison to have them brought. And we see that they were obedient to the Lord. They went. When they heard that, they entered the temple early in the morning and taught. And I, you know, Lord, I'm going to have to pray about that one. I was an angel. You know, let me set out, Lord, I, I, you know, I want someone else to tell me. I need, I need verification. I need a second opinion. And he wasn't like uh, uh, Gideon setting out the, um, the fleeces. All right, Lord, well, you know, if there's dew on the ground and the fleece is dry, then, you know, that, that's fine. Okay, well, that worked. All right, well, let me try it the other way. Well, they were obedient to the Lord. They weren't just hearers, they were doers. Now, hearing the word is nice, but obeying the word is life. And so they're, they're living that out. Even though they know, hey, I'm probably going to get arrested. I'm probably going to get beaten. I'm probably, something bad is going to happen. But as we'll see here in a minute, it's better to obey God than man. Now, this whole time, the council has no idea what's going on. They're, they're escaped. They're in the temple. They're in their territory, teaching 
And the council's getting together, going like, oh, we got these Christians right where they, we want them. You know, guards, bring them in. Go to the prison, bring them to us. Oh, we got something to tell them. Verse 22, we see that, um, we'll see that they're going to be in for a surprise. But when the officers came and did not find them in the prison, they returned and reported saying, indeed, we found the prison shut securely. All right, that's normal. And the guards standing outside before the doors. That's normal. But when we opened them, we found no one inside. Now when the high priest, the captain of the temple, and the chief priest heard these things, they wondered what the outcome would be. I, I would be too. What just happened? So one came and told them, saying, Look, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Can you believe that? The doors were tightly shut and locked. But no prisoners were inside. There's no holes in the wall. The guards were right there. Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm sure they're starting to go, ah, uh, you know, I'm just good. I wasn't here last night. They start blaming the other guy, you know. Uh, he fell asleep. I, I was on watch, you know. I had to, all the different, different things. Where we were here the whole night and nothing happened. No prisoners were inside. And then to add to their surprise, and probably their, their blood pressure, the men were back in the place where they had just arrested them doing what they had told them not to do. And now notice what they are doing. They were teaching. They were teaching. Teaching the people. Giving them the words of this life knowing that they weren't going to like it, the, the council, knowing that they were going to get arrested for it. They had already been, you know, in trouble for it, but they continued to do it. So verse 26, Then the captain went with, with the officers and brought them without violence, for they feared the people, lest they should be stoned. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest asked them, saying, Did we not strictly command you not to teach in this name? And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood on us. They couldn't keep them in prison. They just miraculously escaped. So the rational thing to do would be to arrest them again, right? Hey, if arresting them didn't work once, maybe it'll work twice. Such is the folly of man, trying to work against the Lord. That's what they call insanity, doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different outcome. But notice what, what Luke tells us here. That they brought them in without violence, because for they feared the people, lest they should be stoned, lest the captain, the guards, should be stoned. Not, not the apostles, I mean, the apostles were great. They were giving words of life, healing people, casting out demons, doing all these great things. And the people were on their side. So they did, they did not publicly, publicly beat them or hurt them. Now, we're, we're going to see here in a minute a contrast between the council, the guards, these Roman people, and the apostles. In John 10, Jesus speaks to his disciples about a good shepherd, what a good shepherd looks like, what a good shepherd does. But he also talks about what a bad shepherd does. He calls him a hireling. Hireling only cares about himself. A hireling only cares about what others think of him. A hireling, when danger comes, flees, leaves the sheep. Not my problem. I'm safe, right? Jesus tells his disciples that true shepherds will lay down their lives for the sheep, but a hireling only cares about themselves. We see, you're starting to see more the, the heart and the desire of these council members. Now at this point, the council is embarrassed and can see that their influence on the people is fading and their power was crumbling. I mean, not only had they already arrested these guys for... for this, but now they're acting in direct opposition to what they said. 
We told you not to do this. We strictly commanded you, they say. Did we not strictly command you not to teach in this name? And yet you continue to do it. They're used to, if they say it, it's like law amongst the Jewish people. Because all they had to say was, thus saith the Lord. You need to, or you can't, or you must, and boom. The pe- I mean, the people, they couldn't look it up in the Torah themselves. They didn't have their own copies. They had complete control, complete power over the people. So they say, didn't we strictly command you? And look, notice what they say here. And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine. What a great accusation to bring against the apostles. And I wish someone, you know, that that would be so great. They had filled Jerusalem with this message. And I pray that one day we could be accused of that. Someone from the city of Savannah comes knocking on our door. You know, you guys have spread the gospel message all through Savannah. And we're tired of it. Not just our church, but, but all the churches preaching the gospel message. That's a great... I'm sure the, I'm sure the, the apostles lit. Oh, everyone in Jerusalem's heard our doctrine? That's great! Man, we're doing a lot better than we thought. And I, could ju- I could just see you know, the, the council members, man, they're just livid. Just livid. Now in verse 29, we're going to see Peter's response to this. And, 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 well, and, and actually, before we get there, at the end of verse 28, they say, and you have brought this, you intend to bring this man's blood on us. What's ironic about that situation is when Christ was being offered up by Pilate, Pilate's like, you know, hey, I usually release one prisoner for you guys. So let's, let's get, you know, I'll release Jesus because the only other guy is Barabbas, a murderer, a conniver, a thief. I mean, he's the worst of the worst. And they're like, no, nah, give us Barabbas. But this man's innocent. We don't care. Give us Barabbas. Finally, Pilate, in front of all of them, takes his hands, washes them clean and says, you know, my hands are clean of this situation. And what does the crowd chant after that? His blood be upon us and our children after us. And who is the people inciting the crowd? These chief priests, this council. Man's really good at deflecting blame, deflecting, owning up to, to their sin, right? That's, that's why not everyone is saved. <laughs> that's why in the garden, when God confronts Adam and Eve, and this woman you gave me, God, Eve goes, this serpent... <laughs> But look at Peter's response in verse 29. But Peter with the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you murdered by hanging on a tree. Him God has exalted to his right hand to be prince and savior, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses to these things. And so also is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who, who obey him. Look at the contrast in Peter's answer to what we were told about the guards and the council members in verse 26. Verse 26, we're told that they feared the people. They'd rather obey the people. Whatever the people want, we'll do. As, l- as long as the people are on our sides, as long as you know we look good, as long as people are still coming, Right? Peter says, we ought to obey God rather than man. Something he had already said before, when they were first strictly commanded not to teach in this name. He tells, then in, in chapter 4, he tells them, look, you be the judge. Is it better to obey man or God? Obviously, the, the chief priests weren't going to say, man. <laughs> Boom, all their power would be... So again, he reminds them a little, another little slap in the face to these chief priests. Cut to the heart. We ought to obey God rather than men. 
But not just that. He doesn't just say God. I mean, think about it in our culture. Unfortunately, when someone says, I, I believe in God, you, you have to keep asking questions. All right, which one? Big G, little G? Where's he from? Who created him? Ah, trick question. No one created him. You, you really have to do your detective work to find out God. And you find out, oh, well, God is in the trees and he's in everything. And we're, or we're all gods. Or, I mean, <laughs> my dog is a god. Peter here goes on to describe exactly who this God that he must obey rather than men is. This God that they were trying to stop. This God that they were actually acting against. Notice what he says. And, and Peter, in this, we've seen this now probably the third or fourth time that Peter takes any chance he gets to preach the gospel. He just kind of sneaks it in there. If you, if you, if you read it real fast, you, you might not catch it, especially if you're a Christian, because, yeah, I've heard the gospel. I don't, you know, don't, don't, I don't need that again. Don't, don't tell me that. But he gives them the gospel. Verse 30, the God of our fathers, which he was Jewish, so he was actually saying, and he said our fathers, so he's talking to them too, the God of our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, all the ones after that, David, Solomon, the God of our fathers, you and me, raised up Jesus, whom you murdered by hanging on a tree. Now see, these men particularly were guilty of bringing Jesus to Pilate, to have him crucified. But in reality, just like with the gospel message, we are all complicit in the death of Jesus. It was our sin that he died for. Every single one of us is sin. So boom, in that little verse, Peter gives him the gospel that Christ was raised up, that he died and he raised up and, and we're guilty of his death, that we are sinners. Now see, one thing I love about the gospel, one thing I love about conviction, that's an odd thing to say, right? One thing I love about conviction is giving it to others. No. <laughs> one thing I love about conviction is Godly conviction, there's always a light at the end of the tunnel. And some people are afraid of conviction. They're afraid, I, you know, I, I like going to this church because I don't feel convicted. I like reading this book because I don't feel, I, I don't hang out with them because they always convicted me. The things they would say, the things they did convicted me. I don't like that. It doesn't make me feel good. Well, when it's the Holy Spirit convicting us, He's always encouraging us too. He doesn't convict us and just leave us there in, our, in the mud and the mire and the clay. He convicts us, say, look, you couldn't do it, but God did. You weren't perfect. You aren't perfect. You, but guess who is? God is. Christ is. And he died for your sins. All of them. Past, present, future. As he was dying on the cross, thinking of you knowing that this was the only way to save you because he wanted to have a relationship with you. And I say that because, again, I, we shouldn't be afraid to be convicted. That's God changing us. It's God making us more, molding us more into his image. In Jeremiah, when he used the um, the analogy of, of he's a potter and we're the clay. I mean, when you watch someone make some, you know, something out of clay pottery, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a violent action. Spinning around, not, you know, just pressing, you've got to break it back down and start from the beginning and then to make that thing actually, you know, work. You've got to throw that thing in the kiln. Heat that sucker up. Let it burn. Get all these things out. We're just clay pottery. <laughs> and sometimes it hurts. Sometimes it's spinning, <laughs> uncomfortable. Sometimes it's hot. But in the end, it's, you have a, a, something useful. Now in verse 31, again, leading with the 
conviction and then leading to the encouragement. He says, Him, speaking of Jesus, God has exalted to His right hand to be Prince and Savior, which would offend them because this man Jesus who they had put to death, who they thought was a heretic, is now sitting at the right hand of God. Never in a million years. I'll be at the right hand of God. That's what they thought. What's interesting about verse 31 and what Peter says here is this is the first time outside of the Gospels that Jesus, at least that we have written down, I'm sure they were saying it, but written down that Jesus is proclaimed to be the Savior. And what's interesting about this word Savior in the Bible is the first people to declare that Christ was, was the Savior in the Bible were the Samaritans in John chapter 4. After Jesus meets with the woman at the well and all of her indecencies. And then she's saved. And what does she do right after she's saved? She goes down into the town and says, look, I'm, I'm, I'm changed, I'm new. And they could see it and they start to proclaim, He is the Savior. If you know anything about Jewish-Samaritan relations, you'll know that that's a little crazy. That's a head-turner for these chief priests. It just goes to show that God is reaching to everyone. So here Peter's declaring to them personally, He is the Savior. He's the Savior, as he continues on in verse 31, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Notice there, repentance before forgiveness. All we need to do is repent. Peter wanted them to know that Christ was their Savior personally. Not just like as an affront, like, you know, how you put him to death, and I don't like you, and he was my friend, and that hurt my feelings, and I never want to be friends with you, and you're not allowed in our cool club where we heal people all the time, and I can sometimes walk on water. I did that once. I was cool. No, he doesn't get all, like, hurt. He proclaims to them that Christ is their Savior if they're, if they're repentant. And they can have all their sins forgiven. And the apostles were proof of that. And unfortunately, hard hearts prevailed in this situation. And he continues on in 32, and we are witnesses to these things. The apostles knew that their pur purpose on this earth was to be witnesses of what they had seen and heard. And as he goes on in verse 32, they even have help. We even have help. We have the Holy Spirit also witnessing. Now this was pretty gutsy for Peter to say again in front of these men, knowing that they could make his life and the life of the rest of the church miserable. Yet he was simply proving what Christ had spoken about a time like this with the Holy Spirit. You know, I, I think of myself in this situation. I'd probably be cowering in fear. Yeah, you, you guys are right. I will, I will be quiet. This is getting a, little, getting a little crazy. But in Luke 12, verses 11 through 12, Jesus told his disciples, encouraging them, Now when they bring you to the synagogues and magistrates and authorities, do not worry about how or what you should answer or what you should say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. Jesus encourages them. They, they don't have to do this on their own. I mean, he told them before that the Holy Spirit was their helper, their teacher, their guide, their counselor, their comforter. But he says even more specifically, when you're in a situation like this where, you, you know, it's like, uh, I need to make sure I'm saying all the right things, Jesus just says, just rely on the Holy Spirit. Just rely on the Holy Spirit. He'll teach you what to say. He'll give you the words to say. I mean, not that we shouldn't be studying, studying the Word. But rely on the Holy Spirit. Don't rely on your own intellect. And, you know, I took this class where I could disprove a Mormon in 20 minutes flat, and I'm ready to use it. What is the Holy Spirit telling you to say to that Mormon? Or your neighbor? 
or your boss, or your mother or brother or sister, or your husband or wife. It's really easy to defeat someone in an argument. But he tells them, rely on the Holy Spirit. And we see that here with Peter. Relying on the Holy Spirit. Relying on the Holy Spirit is, that's probably the third theme I've said about the book of Acts this morning. But I would say that's probably the main theme. Is the Holy Spirit working through ordinary people like you and me for the Lord. Verse 33. When they heard this, they were furious and plotted to kill them, obviously. Then one in the council stood up, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, held in respect by all the people and commanded them to put the apostles outside for a little while. And he said to the men of Israel, Take heed to yourselves what you intend to do regarding these men. For some time ago, Theudas, I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, rose up, claiming to be somebody. A number of men, about 400, joined him. He was slain, and all who obeyed him were scattered and came to nothing. After this man, Judas of Galilee rose up in the days of the census and drew away many people after him. He also perished, and all who obeyed him were dispersed. And now I say to you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this is the plan, or for if this plan or this work is of men, it will come to nothing. But if it is of God, you cannot overthrow it, lest you even be found to fight against God. And they agreed with him, and when they had called for the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. That worked the first time. It'll probably work again, right? So they departed, or sorry, we'll stop there. Going back to verse 33, it says they were furious. This would be the natural reaction if you love the power you have over the people and loved your tradition rather than the truth of God. In fact, the Greek doesn't just say they were furious. It says that their heart was cut in two, torn asunder, cut in pieces. They were convicted. They didn't like what they heard. They didn't like, you know, I don't like this church that Peter teaches at because he convicts me. I'm uncomfortable. It says they plot to kill them. Seems pretty bad right now for the, <laughs> the apostles. And I'm sure Peter and John are going, uh, uh-oh, I might have said the wrong thing. <laughs> However, we see an unlikely man rise up actually in defense of the apostles, whether he knew it or not. This man, Gamaliel. Gamaliel, we're told here, is a respected teacher by all the people. In fact, Gamaliel was actually Paul's teacher. In Acts 22, when Paul is kind of giving, his, uh, um, giving off his credentials, he says, I was a student under Gamaliel. And apparently, history tells us that one of the main things that Gamaliel had a problem with with Paul was that he couldn't give him enough books to read. But Gamaliel was highly respected. He wasn't just this random guy. And when, he, when he stood up, I mean, the place quieted. And he gives them a history lesson about two other men that rose up and quickly faded away. The first is Theudas. History tells us that Theudas was a man that told the people that he could part the Jordan River and cause them to walk on dry land. You know, miracles, all that. I mean, flashy. Hey, those are, you know, those prophets of old could do it. I can do it too. You know, parting the Jordan ri- River and causing them to walk on dry land. I wonder where he got the idea from. Probably uh, Joshua. (laughs) But he dies and everyone, you know, oh well, he's not the Messiah. The next is Judas of Galilee. Now Judas is interesting because it says it was taken at the census. This was the same time that Mary was pregnant with Jesus, about ready to give birth to him. Again, as we saw at the beginning, the enemy is always trying to work when the Lord is working. Now, this Judas was a man that opposed taxation and tried causing an uprising, but it ultimately failed. And again, his disciples fell away. Now, Gamaliel, whether he knows it or not, brings up a very important principle here that I think that we all need to learn from. If it is of man, it will die. If it is of God, there is no stopping it.
in, in Luke 137, the angel says to uh, Mary or Elizabeth, I can't remember now, but says, for with God nothing will be impossible. Another time with his disciples, um, when, when he rejects the rich, rich young ruler, and Jesus says, you know, it's very hard for rich people to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. And they say, is it possible that anyone for to, to be saved? And what does Jesus tell them? For with man it is, it is impossible. With God, all things are possible. Gamaliel is telling them that they, want to, they need to make sure they're on the right side. Which group in this story is of man and which one is of God? Again, a very important principle that when it's, when it's left up to man, it's, it'll die, it'll stop, nothing will happen. If it's left up to God, there is no stopping it. And that's an encouragement to us because God's word is filled with promises and prophecies that will come to pass. We've seen that come to pass. If you are a believer here this morning, then that should be some of the best news you can hear. If you're an unbeliever, then that is some bad news if you continue on your path. Because God's word is true even to the unbeliever that one day they will perish in their sins and having to deal with, having to take on God's wrath for their sins. They're going to have to pay the bill. Now, there are also many believers and those in the church, and I, I split those up on purpose, <laughs> that try and do their own thing. An act of man. And it will fail. You see it all the time, these new church programs of building your church, building your ministry. You know, how can you fill the seats? How can you do this? How can you do that? Five years later, you're like, whatever happened to that church? And they burnt out. It wasn't an act of God. It was an act of man. They were worried about what people thought of them. Not just on obeying the Lord, being faithful. Jesus spoke of this in Mark 4, verses 5 through 6, when he's talking about the seed being cast on the different grounds. He says, Some fell on stony ground, where it did not have much earth. And immediately it sprang up, because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched. And because it had no root, it withered away. It was a weed. It wasn't a beautiful flower. It wasn't a beautiful crop. It did not produce any fruit. It had no root. The sun came, withered. Hard times came. People said they didn't like them. So they left. Now remember at the beginning of this story, this all started with jealousy. If the apostles were doing the work of God, then they were... And then they were actually in the same side as the council, at least in the council's eyes, because the council thought they were doing the work of God. And so Gamaliel says, look, if this is an act of man, you know it'll just wither away. But if it's an act of God, let's not fight against him. And they all agree this is wise. It says they beat them, which was no slap on the wrist, but was most likely 40 lashes minus one, something they had... Um, legally were able to do to people. Now in verse 41, So they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple and in every house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. Now how did they leave that place? Bummed? Angry? I mean, they just got beat. No, they were rejoicing. Persecution was something that they realized was part of carrying their cross, following Christ. It was a sign that what they were doing was right. Fruit of their work. They also continued doing what man told them not to do. They taught and preached in the temple and their homes. And Luke rightly divides that up. The temple and their homes. Their walk with the Lord was not something that they just did on Sundays in front of others. If you just said they taught in the temple, but at home, whew, you know, John was somebody else at home. It was something that was brought and lived out in their homes, at their jobs, wherever they were. 
Seven days a week. Daily, it says, they lived this out. Daily. After just getting beat for it. Oh, let me lay low for a little bit. You know, I don't... When Paul, later on in the book of Acts, he's stoned for teaching the people. He's stoned to death. They think he's dead. What happens? He gets up, he goes right back into the city and starts preaching again. My prayer is that we would all be living out our Christian walk in these walls, yes, but most importantly, outside of them. It's really easy to, to look like a Christian amongst a bunch of other Christians, to go with the flow. But the flow is a lot different outside these doors. And it's real easy to just kind of go with their flow. And it's different. We're heading in different directions. The pathway is narrow. Over there, the, the broad is the path. Wide is the gate that leads to destruction. Hey, if everyone's going down that path, you can. the Bible says that's not the path to go down. There is the gate. Few will find it. So in closing this morning, how, how were they able to do all this? Was it because they were the apostles? Certainly God does not hold us to the same standard, right? I mean, he, he, they spent three and a half years literally with Jesus. Well, he has equipped us with the exact same power that they had. That's the Holy Spirit. The book of Acts is a history of the church, but it shows what men and women who are led by the Spirit can do for the Lord. So my encouragement to you, you know, my encouragement to you isn't to go withstand the government and form a militia and all these other things. My encouragement to you is to be filled with the Spirit. That's how you can do all these things. Trust in the Lord. It's pretty simple. Pretty simple to ask. <laughs> it's pretty hard to do. But I thank the Lord that we have His Holy Spirit, His perfect Holy Spirit, guiding us, directing us, teaching us. This morning, if you've learned something, it's certainly not because of me, thank the Lord. It's because the Holy Spirit right now is speaking to you. If you were saved, it's because the Holy Spirit convicted you and led you to Christ. Not because even the late Billy Graham said it, or because Greg Laurie, or because someone argued into it. No, it was the Holy Spirit who saved you, and it's the Holy Spirit that will sustain you through your walk. That was the one thing Jesus told his disciples. Look, I'm leaving, and it's going to be better for you. And it's the same promise for us this morning. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much for your Holy Spirit. Your Holy Spirit guides us, directs us, leads us. That he convicts us, Lord. That's good. I pray we wouldn't be afraid of conviction. Lord, this morning, I pray you would fill us all with your spirit as we leave this place, that it would be said of us that we have spread this doctrine throughout all of Savannah, that it would be said of us that daily, both in the church and in our homes and workplaces and supermarkets and I-16, <laughs> that we were living out this truth. And again, it's only by your Holy Spirit, Lord, that we can do it. If it's, if it's of our own flesh... If it's of our own will, Lord, it, it will come to nothing. But if it's of you, if it's of your Holy Spirit, nothing can stop it. Let us remember that we are, are soldiers sent on a mission that will not fail. And you've given us the equipment, the tools we need, your word, your Holy Spirit, prayer, other believers around us, a church to, to help equip us, So, Lord, I pray that we would, if any of us are just, we're leaking, or we've been empty for a while, that we would cry out to you to be filled with your Spirit. If there's any of us this morning that's never been filled, any of us this morning that's not even saved, well, we pray that your Holy Spirit would do his work to save them, to convict them, to lead them to you, that you died for our sins and you rose again on the third day for us so that we could have perfect communion with you. I pray you bless these people as they leave this place. Protect them, guide them, keep them. It's in your name we pray.
Amen.